Hello lovely people! Welcome to one of my favourite videos to make every year and this is the best non-fiction books that I read in 2023. My usual disclaimer, these are all books I read in 2023. I am not one of those people who only reads books that are published in that year. There are too many good books in the world for that to be the case. In no particular order, I just read some really great non-fiction books and I just want to talk to you about them. For once in my life, I actually might have a actual favourite book. I don't know if this book has just reached mythic proportions in my brain since I have finished it, but I'm going to start off with it anyway. And that is Figuring by Maria Popova. I just fell head over heels for this book this this year. This is creative non-fiction. I read it for my reading my friend's favourite books challenge. I will link to that down below where I talk about it in great detail. But essentially, um, the first line of the blurb is, some truths like beauty are best illuminating by the sidewise gleam of figuring or meaning making. In the course of our figuring, orbits intersect, often unbeknownst to the bodies they carry, intersections mappable only from the distance of decades or centuries. And what this is kind of doing is, it's looking at a lot of people from history. It starts with Johannes Kepler, it ends with Rachel Carson. And it's just going through these people who really like transfigured our way of thinking, um, both in science and art. So we kind of look at how like these things that we kind of view as separate are actually like intrinsically linked. And a lot of these people, like some of these scientists are also like poets and artists and vice versa and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it just goes through lots and lots and lots of figures. A lot of them are queer women, but um, not exclusively. Um, there's a lot of transcendentalism people, that kind of stuff. Um, and it just like is part biography of these people showing you how they fundamentally changed how we like understand the world and all this kind of stuff. And it just made me feel so lit up inside. Like reading this book made me so excited. I've never really connected with science. I do not have a scientific brain. And this book made me like get it a bit <laughs> but I don't know like I cried over this non-fiction book like multiple times that's who I am um I just felt like she painted such vivid pictures of these people that sometimes when we reached the ends of people's lives I felt like I was like leaving a friend behind but also this way of changing how we have viewed the world and our understanding and everything like this like it just blew me away so this might be my favourite non-fiction book of the year. Um, I don't know. Some other books that are also up there is, um, here's a tiny one. This is Lucy Ree by Isabella Smith. I fell head over heels for Lucy Ree's work this year. I went to an exhibition of her work. She's a ceramicist. She continued to create into well into her 80s. She had such a prolific output and I love the pieces that she made. And this is just a very tiny little look at her, her life and her influences in her art. A book that I have lent out to someone is Lapidarium by, I want to say Hetty Judah or something like that. I don't have it with me. I should have written the author name down. This is very much um, one to dip in and out of, but Lapidarium is looking at um, stones, geology, and it's split into different sections and um, each section, I wish I had my physical copy because the cover is so stunning, but then also when you view it side on as the pages, um, you can see the different colours. It goes like down diagonally because it colour codes the different groups of rocks and every little section has like an opening topic that's like a theme, so it might be like precious gems or something. Um, and then you get introduced to it and then you have each stone and then just like a chat about it. I love these books that are sort of a bit magpie-esque. They're very much ones to read in bits and bobs. If you read them too quickly, you, it does feel a bit disjointed. But this one, I just found it fascinating. My gran loved geology and I really wish I had read this when she was still with us and I could have talked to her about it. But um, this look at um stones how like the the practical geology side of it and then also the cultural side of it and the snippets of history and the snippets of art and all that kind of stuff like I'm such a sucker for those books where you just get like little drabbles and that's very much what Lapidarium was um two books by the same author let's just talk about both of them so Paul Baker is an author that I really enjoy and I read two of his books this year so Outrageous the story of section 8 and Britain's battle for LGBT education is all about section 28 which is a piece of legislation and 
And it was essentially, you were not allowed to promote homosexuality as a valid lifestyle option. And it had a massive impact into how things like that were handled in schools and governmental bodies. And I grew up under Section 28. And I definitely, with hindsight, can see, like, the effect it had upon, like, my schooling and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I feel like this did a really great job of showing you the, um, introduce you to political language and that kind of stuff uh, in a very accessible way, in a way that's also rooted in Paul Baker's lived experience, so that if you find the uh, political side of it a bit dry, it's lev it has some levity from, like, his experience living in this time and all that kind of stuff. I thought it was really great. Um, and then Camp is the story of the attitude that conquered the world. This is looking at the idea of Camp, its origins in, like, the Court of Versailles and Louis XIV and all this kind of stuff up until more contemporary times, and it looks at what camp is why is camp so nebulous to describe but also this like political side of camp that is often um ignored forgotten a bit and how we could be really utilizing that political side in the challenges that face us now um so paul baker is an author that i'm just now i just know i want to read everything he writes and i really really enjoy it also really liked free by leah p i read this because of my read the world project it is uh, her memoir about growing up in Albania. I listened to the audiobook and I really enjoyed listening to it on audio. Um, she grows up, she grew up in Albania during the communist regime and then sort of the political disturbances that came about when that was on its way out and that kind of thing. And my the thing I remember most clearly is um, the way that, first of all, she really nailed that, like, childlike understanding of the world. There's lots of stuff very early on which you as an adult can understand some repercussions of, but she's really captured the way that she saw it as a child that is very innocent of some of that. And then that growing awareness, and particularly as um, things become more um, politically unsettled and that kind of stuff, like, this real awakening to from childish innocence to suddenly realizing the severity of experiences that you're having and the fear and all that kind of stuff like I just feel like the way it was written the tone and specifically the way that it was narrated was captured all of that so well so I feel like it's it's not just interesting because of the subject matter I actually think like looking at how a memoir is constructed this is such an interesting example of how do you capture your understanding of the world then tempered with your understanding of the world now and I think it did it so successfully I also really liked Takeaway Stories from a Childhood Behind the Counter by Angela Hui this is uh, Angela's memoir about growing up uh, in rural Wales her family had a Chinese takeaway and it's looking at what it was like growing up in rural Wales being like the only Chinese family like all of their family were in some ways close but you couldn't be too close because you all had Chinese takeaways and you didn't want to be competitors find the history of like adapting food to cultural palettes really interesting like there is a podcast episode by gastropod where they look at um how chinese american food developed and all of the different influences into how they went about adapting food for an american palate and this is kind of doing the same thing like chinese takeaways in the uk are a very specific type of cuisine it's not the same as what these dishes actually are in their origin but it is like a cuisine that has developed that has its own history that we should really respect i lent this to my friend because her partner's family own a chinese takeaway in um cornwall and she said that he read it and like really connected with it because it was like very true to his experience of growing up in like a similar situation um yeah it also has recipes i love when a book has recipes so every chapter ends with a recipe and that's really great another book i really liked was miss major speaks i'm currently off the top of my head forgetting who she did this in collaboration with but i always write all of the books in the description down below so it will be there this is like an interview kind of an interview format but really it's like a chat um where miss major just talks to you about her life experiences and she has such a wealth of experience not just in trans rights activism but in all of the work that she does to help her community and this kind of stuff and she's a real believer in uh putting the work in on the ground and helping the people that need it the most it was just like i really valued just having like an unfiltered experience of this queer elder speaking about her life experiences and all this kind of stuff it was really really great next one i wasn't sure whether to count as non-fiction but i have so this is writings from ancient egypt translated by toby wilkinson as you know if you watched my wrap up i just got like such 
a deep thrill from reading this book is a selection, a very broad selection of writings from ancient Egypt. It covers lots of different things like legal documents, um, inscriptions on tombs, like offering formulas. I studied hieroglyphs at university. I am not a pro. Please do not expect me to be a pro. I am I'd like to downplay any knowledge that I may one day have held. But I really connected with like a younger version of myself reading this and I found it just really fascinating. I enjoyed the breadth of um, things featured in this and it it's that weird thing when you're like, God, I'm connecting with something that someone wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago and that absolutely blows my mind. So really, really like had such a good experience of reading that book. Another food book that I really valued was Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat by, uh, oh, because it's Samin Nosra, I think. Um, this is a cookbook, but it is a cookbook that gives you such practical cooking knowledge. She, like, breaks it down by those four concepts and just gives you, like, actually loads and loads of knowledge about how to put this into practice like when should like salt like when should you salt food what are you cooking at what point should you salt it and why why is it that if you salt this too early it's bad or if you salt it too late you'd have to add loads more salt than you would need if you just did it early enough like all of this stuff it has really fundamentally changed the way that I cook so I always have to mention it I listened to the audiobook, so I didn't have the version with the recipes in, but one day I would like to buy myself that recipe book as a treat because it I would love to cook the things that she talks about as well as just like listening to her talk about how to cook properly. I have two books from the Inklings series to talk about. They're the only books from Inklings that I've read, but they've got a great hit rate so far. First of all is the appendix Transmasculine Joy in a Transphobic Culture by Liam Coneman. This is talking about, well, Liam Coneman began collating the appendix, which was like he began documenting like every instance of transphobia that he encountered in the wild. And then it was like horrendously bad for his mental health. So he stopped. But I really loved his writings on like queerness as a gift and queerness. Like why on earth would I not want to be queer? Like it's other people that's the problem. It's not me. Um, and I really loved that. And I connected with that a lot. And then um, Blind Spot Exploring and Educating on Blindness by Maud Rowell. He's all about navigating the world as a blind person. I'm sure that to some people who are much further along their disability reading journey, this is quite like obvious stuff, but I have not read a book about blindness before. This is my first one. I have some other ones bookmarked that I do want to check out at some point. Um, and I just really, I felt like she did a really good job of challenging our idea of blindness as a monolith and one single experience and all that kind of stuff um, and it's really made me think and I'm definitely going to carry that into my life going forward. A book that I rated maybe not that high at the time but that has stuck with me is Stronger by Porna Bell. I gave it like a 3.5, 3.75 at the time because I found it a little bit repetitive but it is looking at women's relationship with sport and um she's looking at it through like the sort of the the autobiographical aspect of her life is that her husband passed away and through the grief she got into um weightlifting and strength building and all that kind of stuff so there's an autobiographical element that is like her journey with that but a lot of what it is is looking at women's relationship with exercise and how we are shamed and all this kind of stuff she talks about um growing up and going back to see her family in India and being shamed for um, how dark her skin would get when she would play tennis in the sun, like stuff like this, like all these different ways in which different women are shamed for engaging with exercise and stripping all of that back. As I said, at the time I thought it was like absolutely fine. It has really stayed with me and it has really changed how I try and view my relationship to movement. So I wanted to mention it because it is one of those books that actually, now that significant time has passed, I'm like, no, I still think about this book. It has impacted me in a positive way. Um, so yeah, just wanted to mention that. And then finally, I have Super Infinite, The Transformations of John Donne by Catherine Rundell. I really sang the praises of this book and I stand by that. I think that this is such a fabulous piece of non-fiction writing. It's focusing on John Donne, who was an uh, Elizabethan poet, but also had many other hats. He became um, Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. I always forget what the specific word is. Um, and this is, you. Uh, first of all, I'm so sorry, I'm like failing to talk about this book because that's how much I love it. Um, 
Catherine Rundle's sheer enthusiasm for John Donne comes across so strongly. Like, she is sparkling about him. And I I felt it in my soul. Um, I lent this to my partner. He also read it. And then he bought a collection of John Donne's poetry. And I was like, yes, because I'm on a book buying ban and I'm not allowed to buy it. But I do really want to read all of his poetry now because I've read him in bits, but I've not properly deep dived into him. So we're both going to do that sometime in 2024, hopefully. Um, this was just so uh, evocative and it looks at him like we face challenges from trying to look at someone from the Elizabethan period because like primary sources all of these problems but I just feel like her combination of like how she gives you his life story how she interprets his poetry all of this it was just like written so fabulously interestingly I have looked at the other books that Catherine Rondell has written the non-fiction ones and I'm not I've not naturally drawn to any of them but how well this was written makes me think maybe I should just give them a go I'm going to be really interested to see what she does next because um her publishing is like children's books um there's one about like the golden mole and other things from nature and then this and they all feel quite different to each other and I love that I love an eclectic author because I'm an eclectic reader so maybe I should just go for it and check out some of her other stuff I don't know that's it. That's my little selection of sparkling little non-fictions that lit up my 2023. I would love to hear from you if you've read any of these, but also please do tell me what's the best non-fiction that you read. Doesn't just have to be last year, could just be ever of all time. Um, yes, I always get really excited about my non-fiction ones. It's like a third of my reading, but it's always like such a good, like, it just gives me so much. I just find it so exciting. Uh, yes, anyway, I hope you're having a really nice day. I will see you next time for something else.